stunning shots. How better to capture the moment, the memory, the mood, than to take a photograph of the stunning vista laid out before your eyes in England? One of the eternal draws of this island to millions of tourists is the beautiful sights which are everywhere, and it takes very little time, if any, to travel from one stunning landscape to the next. It's all contained in a compact, charming package, ready to share with your envious loved ones. Photographs provide a great service to both the photographer and his friends and family. They record the memory to share and to relive later. There are many times I've looked back on my photos and remembered a scene I had forgotten, relived a memory I had lost. This is also a reason I write my trip reports in such detail, I know my own memory is rather faulty, so I jot down notes every time I sit down to eat during the trip. This helps me write down the narrative later and keeps my memory strong years afterwards. It also helps me realize where I took some of the photographs. The preparation. While there may be a few out there still using film, most people take digital photographs now, and most of those use their phone rather than a camera. If you are still on film, then some of this advice must be adjusted for this fact, so keep this in mind. However, one of the biggest advantages of digital photography is the ability to take as many photographs as you have memory space for, and sort later the ones you wish to spend money on printing. Most folks use their phones to take photos now. And to be fair, phone cameras have improved in leaps and bounds and are often better than a regular digital camera. However, keep in mind that memory capacity might be an issue. Some folks, like me, still prefer to carry a regular camera. I sell large format prints, so I still like to use my 83X optical zoom. I'm not much of a movie taker, but some people prefer video to photographs. If so, much of this will also apply to the video recorder shopping. Again, if you use your phone, that doesn't apply. The equipment. Not everyone needs or wants a professional grade camera. These can cost over $5,000 and most people don't have this in the budget. Even high-grade amateur cameras, which usually run between $400 and $1,000, are outside most people's budget and desire. However, a decent amateur camera can be gotten for about $150 to $200 and, in my opinion, are well worth the investment. You should, however, do your research and decide which camera is right for you. If you are not planning on printing your photographs in huge sizes for hanging on the wall, your smartphone camera should be sufficient. There is an excellent site at Digital Photograph Review which allows you to choose cameras by feature and compare them side by side. I have used it many times to choose my next piece of equipment. You will need to decide which features are important to you. Since I take a lot of landscape shots, and often from the window of a moving car, long optical zoom and fast shutter speed are very important to me. The ability to shoot in raw format, which doesn't let the camera do any editing of the image, is also important to me, as I do a lot of post-production manipulation in Photoshop. Is low-light photography important to you, for night shots or party shots? How about close-ups for flowers and other macro photography? Once you know what is important, you are ready to choose a decent camera. By the way, some of the best shots I've taken have been from a point-and-shoot $80 camera. Good equipment is helpful but is not essential. The art is truly in the eye of the artist, not the equipment they use. The accessories. Many cameras come with interchangeable lenses, one for macro, one for zoom, etc. The higher-end professional cameras have this as a matter of course. The point-and-shoots do not, for the most part. The rest of us are in the middle. My camera of choice right now is the Nikon Coolpix P900, which does not have a removable lens. The installed lens can zoom 83x, which means it can get decent moon shots and decent macro shots. I'm happy with this range and would rather not mess with multiple lenses. This is my personal choice, and it may not be yours, so experiment with a few. Go to the store, 
pick up the camera with all its accessories. Do you want to be hiking up a mountain and through an airport, carrying all this? Or is it worth it to you? Memory, 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 without it, you are done with your digital diary. Uploading to the cloud might not always be practical. There are several options to make sure you have enough on your trip. Memory sticks of any type are pretty cheap. My option this last trip was simply to take enough sticks to make sure I never ran out of room. I never came close, even after 9,900 photos. I always, always, however, take at least one more than I think I will need, in case one gets corrupted or lost. Another option I've done in the past is take a laptop and download the card each night. This is fine if you are already planning on taking a laptop, not so much if you'd rather not carry the extra weight. If you are staying at a place with good Wi-Fi, you might upload to the cloud each night, but some sites have memory caps and uploading hundreds of photos and videos does take time and bandwidth. It's worth a note to say if you do, for some reason, accidentally erase the photos from your card, don't despair. Also, don't touch it. Don't try to take more pictures with it, save it until you can get in touch with an expert, he she should be able to get most of the data from it. My friend Carla did this on our trip to Scotland, 1,200 photos erased in the blink of an eye. She held on to it, and when she returned, she was able to get back about 90% of those precious memories she captured with the help of a data recovery specialist. The Method England is truly a land of wonders. It is not a large place, but it is packed with stunning seascapes, rolling hills, charming manor houses, romantic ruins, and bucolic pastures. The last time I went to England, over the course of two weeks, I'd racked up over 7,000 photos. I believe in the theory you take as many photos as you possibly can on site, as you can always sift through them later. Different perspectives, different lighting, and different levels, a couple will turn out well. You can't as easily go back and revisit the site. Even the few times I have revisited a place and took a photograph, I've discovered the landscape has changed. Traveling to Whitby in 2000, and then again in 2008, parts of it looked completely different due to construction, time, and weather. In England, you are tempted to stop every five minutes on your journey to take a photo of the lamb nursing by the side of the road, the ruins on the hill, or the charming, thatched cottage on the road. Go ahead and do it. Do it safely, mind you. There are usually small laybice, pullouts, which you can turn into for a very short period, don't park there, they are for passing, not parking, or driveways you can turn into. This is a country made for photo opportunities, after all. After you've seen your hundredth sheep or so, you may be less tempted to stop at the sight of each one. You should keep in mind some basic photography truths, but also keep in mind these are rules, and rules are sometimes meant to be broken. The rule of thirds, composition is more interesting when objects and horizon lines are on the top or bottom third of the picture, or the left slash right third. Lines, roads, fences, and other lines lead the eye into a particular spot, make sure the spot has something interesting. Scale, the mountain photo is great but how big is it? Take a shot with a flower, tree, or cottage in the foreground to lend a perspective of scale. Weather, the weather in England is part of the landscape. Use it to your advantage. There's a storm coming in, wouldn't a dark cloud look dramatic over the castle? Move your body until you can get the shot lined up right. And then run for the car before the deluge hits. Perspective, more interesting points of view can change the feel of a photo. Shooting straight up on a castle wall or a tree, or down on a flower can work wonders. Action, a standing sheep is lovely, but getting a lamb while it nurses, or a pony while running makes the photo much more interesting. Lighting, sunrise and sunset, storms and clouds, and the ever-present mists of England can make some amazing atmospheric shots. One reason I like staying in one place for several days is to have several opportunities to take photos at different times of the day and night. The Locations 
While all of England is picturesque and charming, and different people like different things, there are certain places, subjects and areas which stand out as being incredibly photogenic. Cliffs England is rugged and rough in its landscape and has a long and varied coastline. My favorite place in the world is to be on a sea cliff, looking down at the ocean crashing upon the rocks far below me. I love the mix of sea, wind, and earth, and I feel like I'm standing on the edge of the earth. As a result, I take many of my photographs in such spots. Whether it is the White Cliffs of Dover or Glebe Cliffs at Tintagel, I love the places where the water meets the land. Water, lakes and rivers have coastlines as well, and England certainly has its share of picturesque places along its waterways. Many large lakes, such as Windermere, Oldswater, or Bassenthwaite, have stunning scenery to capture. Castles, England has hundreds of castles, ranging from grand palaces which will rent you a room for the night, to crumbling ruins which barely hold a full wall against the tide of time. Each castle is unique and has photographic charm of its own. Some areas are more castle-rich than others, such as Sussex, but there are random ruins wherever you go. Some seemingly don't even have a name, it being lost in time. Today, they are just a nuisance to the local farmer who cannot farm this part of the land. Critters, sheep, cows, goats, donkeys, chickens, and horses. There are others, but these are what I see most of in England. Sheep, and some more sheep. And look, there are some sheep. And a horse. And more sheep. If you visit in April or May, you will see adorable lambs running after their mothers, looking for lunch. Cities, London is a jewel in the crown of the world, with beautiful architecture, but don't discount York, Oxford, or Bath. York has a rich heritage and a plethora of historic buildings, as well as the fabulous York Minster. Oxford is known as the City of Dreaming Spires and houses one of the most famous universities in the world and Bath is filled with Georgian architecture and Roman sites. Flowers, England has many incredible gardens, ranging from the Royal Botanic Gardens, Kew in London to the gardens at Sissinghurst Castle in Kent or Storehead in Wiltshire. Most cottages and houses have small, well-tended flower gardens in their homes, and the English take great pride in these miniature beauties. Cottages, nestled in the verdant quilt of the English countryside, the humble cottage stands as a symbol of rustic serenity. Its stone walls, kissed by the passage of time, echo with stories of yesteryears, whispered on the breeze that rustles through the ivy clinging tenderly to its facade. People, ever friendly, the people of England are usually game for posing for a photograph. Often, after a few pints in a pub, they'll not say no. Do be respectful, though, these folk are trying to go about their day, and some are quite busy with their lives. Stones, yes, stones. England is a very rocky country. And while the cliffs are made of stone, so are the Neolithic burial sites, the stone circles, and the barrows. There is great texture and pattern in stones of all types. The north, in particular, has many of these, but they dot the entire land. Churches, lovely churches both in Anglican and Catholic flavors are everywhere. In addition, hundreds of abbeys, both ruined and restored, are open for exploration. Larger communities may have temples or churches of other faiths, such as Muslim, Jewish, Methodist, etc. All of them are an important part of the cultural and physical landscape of the land. Whatever you do, do not be afraid of walking off the beaten path. Climb into the forest, up a rock, into a graveyard, around a stone wall, the possibilities are endless. Of course, be aware of your surroundings and dress appropriately for your adventures. Bring what supplies are required, such as walking sticks, sturdy shoes, water and food, etc. If you are truly adventurous, go on a mountain walk, please, with an experienced guide. Keep in mind some sites are only accessible if you walk through someone's yard or field. This is allowed but do be respectful with the owner's permission, as this may be a working farm or other place of business, and do no harm to the property. 
the aftermath. Inevitably, you get home and look at your photos, and you are disappointed. You remember it being much more breathtaking than the photo could capture. This is, unfortunately, due to the limitations of modern technology. While today's cameras are incredible, they still are not the human eye and can only capture a thin slice of the wonder we see with our own incredibly complex eye structure. Even the eye cannot truly see all our mind imagines when we look upon a fantasy landscape like England. Our imagination fills the fairy hills and standing stones with mystery and wonder. Our eye only sees part of this, and the camera captures even less of it. One of the reasons I unapologetically manipulate my photographs is I want to share what my mind saw at the location, not what my eye saw, or what the camera captured. I want to share this with those who couldn't be there to experience it with me. It's a tall order and sometimes very difficult to accomplish, but I work at it until I am mostly satisfied with my results. I usually print my photos in small format first, to see how they come out in that format, the computer screen sometimes isn't the best portrayal of print photograph. I then order the prints larger to sell. I use a company called White House Custom Copies. You can upload your photos to their server and receive them a couple days later. I've never had a problem with WHCC, and their customer service is top-notch. I've also printed canvas prints with Simply Canvas and books and calendars at Lulu. There are many ways to share your memories with those you love.